Welcome to Gold Derby's film cinematography panel. I am senior editor Marcus James Dixon, and we are here with Christina Dunlap from American Fiction. And Christina, I, I kind of want to start with the recent film festival circuit where American Fiction wins the People's Choice Award at Toronto and the Audience Award at Middleburg, among others. Uh, what were those moments like when you heard about the prizes? Did you all kind of feel like we have made it on the scene? Yeah, I mean, um, I was saying earlier, I, I unfortunately wasn't at Toronto because I actually had a baby the same week the film premiered, so I wasn't able to go, but I did get to go to the Austin Film Festival that we just found out that we won an award at yesterday, um, and getting to see the audience response was just incredible. I think that it's an experience that is is unlike any other theater experience. And when I saw the film there and, and seeing the audience's reaction, I I kind of understood the wave that, that Cord had been experiencing because he's been texting me and telling me about it and just so excited. Everyone's so thrilled with the response because we're all so passionate about the film and so proud of what we made. And the fact that it's resonating with audiences, just it means the world to all of us. It's so cool to to see that happen. And Cord Jefferson is the producer, writer, director of American Fiction. What was his overall vision of the movie's look and, and how were you able to help see that through as the cinematographer? Well, you know, it, it was Cord's first feature, which he's been really open about. But I think as a director, writer, so much of that vision is that when he was writing the, the script, whether he realized it or not. So early on, I, I didn't want to take him down any specific path right away. I came to our initial meeting with a lot of ideas and sort of, sort of how I was seeing the film play out because tonally it's a satire, but at its core, it's really a family drama it's about complicated relationships it's a really beautiful story at the heart of it of you know siblings coming together and finding love and hard times and so I didn't want to shoot it like a traditional comedy and I didn't want that to be the heart of what it was and I think for both of us um, the lead character Monk is such a isolating character he really pushes everyone away and we wanted to sort of show that visually and we also you know we shot in 26 days with one pickup day in LA so we didn't have a lot of time and uh couldn't get all the coverage that we dreamed of so we sort of try to find ways to cover the film in flowing steady cam moves and things where I could move through our, our extraordinary cast. Sometimes there were eight people in a scene and I knew we'd never get all the coverage. So early on, I just worked with Cord to watch as much as possible. We really talked about the tones of the film and what we wanted the audience to feel and then honed in on it from there. And it is the perfect mix of, of drama and of laughs. And it, in the screening I was at, uh, one of the biggest laughs was when Issa Rae's character was reading from her book, Weez Lives in the Ghetto. And <laughs> the first person to stand up is this nice little white lady with gray hair. And she kind of blocks our view of Jeffrey Wright, um, Wright's character. Um, filming that scene must have been just really fun. Can you talk about that at all? Yeah, it's actually um, when Cord and I first started putting this together and putting the shot list together, he showed me this gif of David Robinson, who is, you know, at a game and he's sitting on the bench and the camera is on him. And suddenly this white woman just stands up in the audience and completely obscures him. And he showed me this gif. He was like, I feel like this is a metaphor for the whole film. And so that stuck with me and I wanted to find a way to to use that. And um, when we were blocking the scene with Issa, we just were like, oh, this is the moment because it's sort of the crux of, of Jeffrey's character feeling all of these things and seeing everything he's up against and then just completely being obscured by a white audience member. So um, 
that it's actually the first time I've ever used a GIF as a film reference, but it's one of my favorite shots in the movie and something that, you know, we were both really happy to sneak in there. And then over on the dramatic side, there's the moment where Jeffrey Wright's character, Monk, he's looking through the hospital window at his sister's foot, uh, played by Tracy Ellis Ross. I'm, I'm not going to give anything away because some people <laughs> haven't seen the movie yet, but it's such a powerful moment. Can you talk about setting that scene up? Yeah, we talked a lot about that scene and without giving away, you know, it's sort of an abrupt moment and we really didn't want to have it seem overdone. It was really about Jeffrey and and his reaction in that moment. And so we wanted to be on his face as much as possible. And it's sort of, you know, the old takeaway from Jaws is the less you see, the more impactful it is sometimes. So that was our, our thinking in that moment. And throughout the movie, there are so many beautiful shots by the water at the lake house, under the moonlight. How important was it to use natural light in many of these scenes? <laughs> well, the beach house, you know, I wanted it to feel as natural as possible, but the the location we ended up choosing had all dark wood interiors, which was terrifying for me because we wanted to see the ocean through the windows. That was really important. So, you know, there was over, outside was over F64 and inside was a 0.8. So using natural light <laughs> went out the window, we had to pump as much light into the house as possible. And with our budget, it was a, you know, a feat. And uh, I'm really proud of the g &E team and what we were able to accomplish there. And then outside, you know, it was about finding the right time of day and, and shooting it then. And on our very tight schedules, we really had to be in a specific location at a specific time. And everyone worked really hard to make that happen. So we could use the natural light when we, when we needed to. It blows my mind that you were able to do this in 26 days, a full feature film. Um, what would you say was the biggest challenge having that that time crunch working against you? <laughs> I, I mean, every day the, the schedule was very ambitious. Um, I think, you know, it was scheduled very well with the locations to the best of our ability to sort of make sure we we shot out a certain location before moving on and um i don't know honestly it was it was it was a challenging schedule but the team was just so incredible and everyone was so passionate about the content um it, you know it's adapted from percival everett's book erasure and I read the script and I immediately went and read the book. And, you know, I was talking to our Dolly Grip Wally, who also read the book. And most of our g &E team went and read the book. And it was just, I've never been on a set like that, where everyone loved the script and cared about it so much that they went on to read the <laughs> source material immediately after. So I think it was just everyone's dedication to the project that, that made us get through the, the tough schedule. And a uh, final question here, were there any camera shots or memorable moments in the movie that you really want to highlight? Uh, that's something that you're really proud of, maybe that you couldn't believe you were able to pull off. That is a tough question. I guess that the shot on the beach when Monk loses his mother was a particularly challenging one. We had, you know, I had, big ticket items that I was only able to have on certain days. And one of those was a, you know, very large condor. And of course the wind was up that night and we knew we couldn't shoot it the next day because it was the night that we had it. So we waited out the wind and we were just, it seemed like all of the natural elements were against us and it was freezing. And Leslie Uggams was on the beach in a nightgown at eight years old. And, you know, she kept wanting to do another take. She was so incredible and to work with. And um, that was a, a particularly hard scene that I'm, I'm proud of how it, it turned out and what we were able to accomplish. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us and stick around, Christina, for the group panel uh, in a few minutes here. Thank you.
Okay. Welcome to Gold Derby's film cinematography panel. I am senior editor Marcus James Dixon, and we are here with Matthew Lipatique from Netflix's Maestro. Um, Matthew, how much work and planning went into that opening montage where, where Leonard Bernstein, played by Bradley Cooper, wakes up and, and takes the phone call and runs through the various hallways and arrives at the theater? It was a very memorable, fun scene, and yet it looked very complicated. I, you know, in retrospect, yeah, it was probably pretty complicated, but we, you know, uh, Bradley had this vision for that shot, for that, the way the film would open up and uh, sort of open up into Carnegie Hall. And it was just, in, within his vision, he sort of, he, he, want, he wanted to sort of have this God POV, which necessitated the camera to be up above everything and the set to be built a certain way. And that movement really, is, it was planned to be more, linear I would say but because of the motion and the freneticism of his character uh, it just became this sort of floppy messy thing that graduated into this uh, lyrical shot inside Carnegie Hall and I, I um, we were fortunate really fortunate that when we did test Bradley and I we we sort of planned out the very beginning of that scene and that sort of went a long way into figuring out the, the entire shot from the bedroom and his apartment all the to the to the venue. And how long did that take to finally, you know, to finish the blocking and, and to film? I mean, it was a it was a long pre-light. I mean, it was complicated. We were shooting fifty two twenty two, which is two hundred ISO, and um, so there's a lot of light involved. And it was a pretty big run. So it's an apartment set, and then it was just a it was the um, hallway, and uh, so that that. Uh, it was a little, it took a while, it took a, a better part of a day, most of the day in a pre-light to get it rigged properly. But then uh, we were able to get the crane in and rehearse that shot, uh, you know, the day before, after we got rigged. So we had a day ahead of time. So it didn't take that long to get it, to be quite honest. I don't think we did that many takes of it. Mm. Um, more, I would expect more. I mean, we could have shot the thing all day, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. And Bradley is the star, director, producer, writer of Maestro. And you previously worked with him on 2018's A Star is Born. And I'm curious, what did you take from that experience? And how did the past collaboration with him help you out on this new project? I mean, every anytime you have an opportunity to work with somebody a second time, you know, you get this uh, there's a shorthand. And there's a tendency that you get used to that you could rely on. So that um, you know, more time can be spent on ideas and executing and figuring out how to execute those ideas. Uh, just getting to know somebody, you know, it, you get to know somebody so well after making a film with them, especially when the film is successful. Uh, it shows. Right? I don't think that the dysfunction usually doesn't bear gifts of success when it comes to film. So uh, you know, having sort of a a good relationship and hit, sort of having you know the sort of um, synchronicity with the director, you know, it helped on the first film and then we just, we just followed along on the second film, really. Um, but he was, I have to say, he was he was very motivated and he was so driven uh, on Maestro and I think his performance shows that and I think his director shows that. And tell us about your choice of filming in black and white for the earlier flashback scenes. What, what was the ultimate goal that you were hoping to accomplish? I think transporting, transporting uh, the audience into that time period, really, and knowing the screenplay, it wasn't my choice necessarily. We had talked about Bradley wanted to shoot portions of it black and white, and we were trying to figure. We did try to. We struggled, and a lot of discussions leading up to the film about what was going to be what aspect ratio, what was going to be color. Um, at one point, we were going to shoot the contemporary, the most contemporary part of the film in digital, and we abandoned that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but black and white was always in the conversation, and. Um, you know, we tested digital black and white, and then we, it, it was just, it was a no brainer when we started, we started to test black and white film. And um, we, you know, it's just really to transport him in that time and just sort of demarcate these time periods in his life. Mm. And framing uh, much of the movie in the four by three square format as opposed to the widescreen format, what ultimately made you decide to, to go that route? Again, it was, it was more of a Bradley decision. That's how he saw the film. Like he, you know, more than even, you know, he, more than most, he really had a vision for what he saw and how he saw it. And he, it's, it's not like he does boards. He's very, as an actor, I think he's very descriptive, <laughs> you know? And uh, 
he has the ability to sort of explain exactly what he has in the vision. He doesn't, you know, he'll, he's very active with the camera and he just, he, we work out the shot and we work out the composition. And um, he, he's very daring, he's very daring. And he wanted to push the edges of the frame, I think. And we try to do that as much as possible to push the edges of the frame. Hmm. There's a really fun musical dancing moment midway through the film where, where Bradley actually gets up and starts dancing himself. Uh, do you have any fun stories from, from shooting those moments? I mean, it was, uh, you know, again, it was the St. James Theater. You know, shooting at Carnegie Hall in the St. James Theater, was just, it was a thrill. I mean, as, as difficult as it is from a technical standpoint, a logistical standpoint, you can't help but feel the sort of aura of um, history. <laughs> behind the places, you know, um, and just working with these dancers who, who, you know, who studied Jerome Robbins and, you know, they were just incredible, incredible. And I had worked with, obviously I've worked with dancers before, but um, this was a little different and just, just, just working in that, it's always fun to work in a different realm, a creative realm, whether you're working with dance or you're working with music. And this, this film have, had both. So it was, um, you know, it's one of my favorite things to do. And what would you say is the biggest challenge in, in trying to make the orchestra scenes look dynamic and appear alive on screen, particularly at the end, there's this very elongated um, orchestra sequence. And, and how do you keep viewers' attention? Because I, I couldn't look away. It was just, you know, the sweat coming off of his, his face. I was like, very transfixed uh, in that moment. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I used to say this thing in music videos, when something wasn't working in all the vignettes that you would shoot, that you could always come back to the band. So we didn't really spend so much time thinking about how to portray this orchestra as much as how do we how do we make sure that we feel like we just were always with Lenny. And um his performance is, you know, otherworldly in that scene, I think. And it, I just it it motive it so much so that there was a standing ovation from the or London the London Philharmonic after it. So it was it was it was a pretty moving experience to be there. And listening to the, the some of the best musicians in the entire world playing this playing Mahler in this cathedral, I have a front row seat, and I'm watching one of the best performances I've ever I've ever photographed. So, um, I think it's probably a highlight. Hmm. Yeah, I've been a fan of Bradley since he was on Alias, the TV show, and I think this is the best I've ever seen him. You know, in my in my life. So, well done to everyone involved. Um, I I love the scene personally where. Bradley, we see his large shadow conducting over Carrie Mulligan's uh, very diminutive frame. She kind of, she's kind of in the corner watching him. Could you expand on that visual? How did you get that just right? It was uh, it was not easy actually. It was we we were experimenting with different lights to create the shadow, and uh, it was it's a pretty wide shot as you can see to get the size of the shadow he was looking for. And we used a light called the Bad Boy, a moving light that we could spot and flood and uh, we can dim. So there was, there's a bit of, there's a bit of a um, lighting cues, a few lighting cues that are going on as the camera's pushing in on that, because as soon as we got too far, we were shot in his shadow, we were entering his shadow space and the camera shadow would be there. So there's a, a pretty complicated cross fade happening that would take away her key light, but to put another key light in from a different direction. And then uh, his shadow would disappear and you didn't see the camera. So. It was a little complicated, but I um, and sometimes I feel like we could have done it better. <laughs> I don't know about that. I, I mean, clearly it was my favorite. I am curious, what was your favorite? Um, not really scene, but like a, a camera angle or or a moment that you would like to highlight for us here as we as we close out the interview. I mean, I guess it would be the beginning. You know, I just, it was something we had been talking about from you know, years before we even shot. Bradley and I had been talking about the film, and he'd, he would, he'd be inspired. He'd give me a phone call. We would talk on a FaceTime or a Zoom and just sort of hash out what he was thinking. And, and um, to see it, to actually execute it on the day um, and see, and you know, and then actually see it come to life, I think is probably the most gratifying thing for some reason for me. And so one thing I keep going back to, even though, the London, the the um, the Ely Cathedral was a highlight of my career. I think what's most gratifying is just that sort of sense of completion that you you know after talking about something so long, um, it feels really good to do. 
Well, Matthew, thank you so much for chatting with us. And we'll see you in a little bit here at the group. Okay. Thanks, guys. Welcome to Gold Derby's Film Cinematography Panel. I am Senior Editor Marcus James Dixon, and we are here with Lena Sandgren from Saltburn. And first things first, I'm, I'm curious about the discussions that went on behind the scenes regarding the, the four by three aspect ratio of the film, making it more like a television screen than a film screen. And I've seen Emerald talk about this, but I would, I would love to hear your perspective as well. Mm. Well, um, exactly, you know, like, I think the aspect ratio is important. Uh, so it's always like you you have these discussions early on. I think she she felt that she wanted it to feel a bit like you're peeking into this dollhouse because uh, a huge part of this film is taking place in, in this manner, right? Like this English Gothic uh, manner. So, and, and, and she wanted the film to feel like voyeuristic and that we're looking into this like peeking in. So for her, it felt like square. But in the discussions, um, there's so many things to discuss, right? But kind of uh, early on as well with the entire look of the film, I, you know, I'm asking her a lot of questions about if she could provide me with like words or with uh, metaphors or, or things, whatever that that is that just comes to her mind. And in these discussions, she kind of came in on this that this film is sort of um, kind of a vampire film and being a vampire film in that realm that we started to explore them with like visual references i felt like um paintings um from you know uh, the baroque era or like the the the, the old um, 20s sort of german expressionistic um, silent movies um have have sort of that kind of vibe of um of 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 of, of something that could create a, you know kind of interesting compositions i thought like interesting compositions and it has a relationship between both the sort of um, that gothic house and the paintings how they were painted these families that the family that lived there has always been painted in these paintings so so all together it kind of made most sense for us to go with 133 which uh to me is more like actually just a full frame um you know super 35 and 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 kind of reminds me of the the classic ways they did silent movies and it kind of fit the theme in general i thought like to 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 do it that way but we we did go back and forth between like thinking also about the benefits of of wider formats but why we eventually uh, honed in on the one uh, 133 was to um, what was when we discussed the the, the details of uh, close-ups and details because she was very much into seeing a lot of sweat a lot of hair a lot of like close-up on things so we had we sort of created this uh, language of either it was like composed um kind of formal com formally composed simple shots of 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 of, of the scenes or you go in on like really tight details. And when you go in on tight details in 240, for example, I feel like you see off the subject um, kind of, and in, in the square format, you go more like in on exactly what you wanna, wanna, wanna see and you focus in on something in the center. So, but th there's always like many reasons I think behind, it's just important in the beginning to discuss all of that and, and sort of try to make the right choices and, and not just make a choice for for whatever reason, but like to have something, <laughs> think about something, uh, why you why you do it. But so I think it was a combination of things that somehow between her original uh, vision and how I, 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 I sort of felt like we should illustrate it from her point of view's vision, then it sort of came into that uh, format and, and the lighting and everything is kind of connected, I think. And do you remember what your reaction was the first time you arrived at this beautiful location, this mansion? And were you already at that moment thinking about shots and angles that you could use in the picture? Um, I mean, I, I thought it was stunning. Very much of that, of what you see in the film is is the actual house. Uh, we did some um, set builds just for for practical reasons to to connect uh, the bathroom with the two um, um, bedrooms. But 
but in general, I, I thought it was uh, incredible. I mean, it's it's a museum. You know, you can go into that room and take anything to to the antique roadshow. You know, it's just like insane. And and what what was interesting to me was like how how inspiring it was because they had a lot of like really obscure weird paintings uh, 300 year old paintings of dead children and they had like in the garden they had like this statue of a man hammering down on another man you know and and it's like kind of interesting um how the art looked like back then um so we obviously yeah i mean you when we walked around we we hadn't storyboarded the film or or so, but we had an idea of that, um, the, the the sort of painterly composition. So so we went in to to look at angles from that point of view, kind of thing. But then when you see something like their staircase, uh, they had this. They had two staircases. Both were kind of incredible. Uh, one was full of mural, like beautiful old paintings, oil paintings, and the other one was just a very unique spiral staircase that, for some reason, I think don't really exist much elsewhere it's like a very unique uh, construction and we just want to use everything we we want to like utilize everything so i think within the house we're we're moving around quite quite good um so yeah i mean it, it it's a huge part of the of the story and and inherent sort of in the way the story is told the house is sort of meant to feel like it's keeping um keeping a mystery or keeping keeping some uh, secrets right so so we and and we were never actually wanting to see the house um in broad daylight either we kind of emerald always wanted the house to feel like kind of exposed uh like they did in like the baroque paintings uh you know like type of kind of caravaggio style where the light comes from outside the windows and 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 hits in and then you expose for sort of the the sun more than the the shadows, you know. So so all of that is obviously also something you consider when you walk around in a house. But it had, I mean, it had so much to to give us, like so, make it much easier for us to to actually shoot the film. Uh, thanks to the house a lot. Yeah, it was like a character in the movie That's mm. easily. Um, and Barry Cogan's new dancing scene at the end. This is something that's going to be discussed for years to come. How do you approach such a vulnerable scene like that as a cinematographer? How do you, where do you start? Um, well, first of all, I feel like you always, I always feel like I want to tell the emotional story and like consider the emotions in the scenes uh, more than the actual plot. Like, so he he wakes up and walks through the house, right? Like that could be, and it's joyful, but what's the emotion here? And he's sort of king of the castle. And, um, oh, I mean, how much can we talk about this shot? But but um, without saying too much then, then I think anyway, um, I kind of felt like, uh, which, I mean, both me and Emerald felt because we did the scene towards the end of the shoot and we had already done a lot of scenes that, are those scenes that are much more um, um, sort of um, strange and, and special. And so this scene was nothing else but like, it was vulnerable, but at the same time, he's sort of king of the castle. So he is kind of a extrovert with himself, but it wasn't about adding to it. Cause I feel like in throughout the whole film versus other films that sometimes you want the camera to be very, um, uh sort of active right like tell the story uh, make the audience feel i feel like we were more voyeuristic and try to compose shots that you could sit in and hopefully you are sort of seducing the audience with the acting and the, the composition is just letting you watch it and you could go in on details for for sort of uh, as a thing but otherwise you kind of just want to observe and then let the audience judge um, if you know if how, what you can tolerate and what you like. But in this case, same thing. I feel like it was his. He's by himself, and we're just observing him, like very simple, um, walking through the house. But I mean, we're traveling through the house, but he's dancing. So, but it's really happening in in the reality of the film. It's not like a, a 
you know, a, a superficial dance number. It's more like he's actually just having a great day, right? So, so I think um, less is more in a little bit in this film with in terms of like how much the camera is involved. And rather we focused more on like in general in the film to uh, sort of light the scenes from outside and and create um, sort of compositions that that um, we could stay in for as long as possible or like tell the story as efficient as possible and not sort of shooting it coverage style, but rather um, thoughtfully composed kind of thing. So that was kind of a little bit different from how I normally um, think of things, but that came out of, yeah, out of the discussions early on how we wanted to approach the film to to make the most emotional uh, storytelling. But but yeah, so, but that was a fun scene to do and it was actually not at all any strange for us because we had done so many other scenes that were more strange. So uh, <laughs> it, it was more like a, just a, a, a great, we wanted it to feel like a great feeling for you know which could be awkward for the audience uh, as well i think it's probably double uh, what you feel about the scene well um, Lina, thank you so much for taking us uh, inside saltburn and and stick around we'll talk to you in a little bit in the group panel sure welcome to gold derby's film cinematography panel i'm senior editor marcus james dixon and we would like to welcome back to our Roundtable discussion, Christina Dunlap from American Fiction, Matthew Libatik from Maestro, and Lena Sandgren from Saltburn. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm curious, when you begin a brand new project, like when you're reading the script for the first time, are you already picturing in your heads how you're going to shoot the scene? Or does that come later? Like, Tell me about your individual process. And Christina, I'll come to you for this one first. I think, you know, it really depends on the director's style. So I can kind of speak to how it worked with Cord was we we definitely had a shot list and I, I worked as an editor before, you know, I, I tried to work in every department on the film set before I actually made it to being a DP, which was always the goal. But uh, when I worked as an editor, you know, it's really crafted how I tell stories. And so I actually sort of shot list and edit order, which maybe isn't always the best <laughs> way because then I have to take it back and put it in shooting order. But we we definitely wanted to come up with a visual style for the film that was going to not mislead the audience because like I was saying, while it is this satire, it's also a family story. And there's also scenes without giving too much away that are quite meta. So we wanted to weave in that meta aspect, um, which really takes off, I would say, halfway through the film. And yeah. And Matthew, how about you? Uh, rarely. I mean, unless it's in the description, I don't. I try to read it with an open mind. Uh, of course, you, you know, you can imagine things. Um, I kind of imagine how something's going to look. Um, but I don't think about how I would shoot it. Uh, I don't really talk about, I don't, you know, shots and how one camera moves to another camera position. I don't think about those things. They literally try to get the feeling of it. Uh, because typically you're reading a script to meet the director on um, in a meeting or a call or an interview. You just want to understand it wholeheartedly and as much as you can. You want to dive deep into the characters and have some kind of theory about where you think the narrative structure is or where you think the character arc is or what it is. And uh, so I concentrate on those things first. I think the cinematography comes after that. And Linus? Yeah, I agree with uh, Maddie. I feel like um depends on how um, the script is um written obviously you could sort of get it's kind of hard to resist to see images you kind of feel the look of the film a little bit maybe but i try to not talk about it or or project it on the director until i've spoken to the director and i really want to get the director's vision uh, clear uh, in my head and ideally the it, it, it's really what what happens first in my process is to try to undo everything I learned, <laughs> like start with a blank page 
and uh, listen a lot to the director, ask questions, try to sort of talk not so literally, literally about the script, but rather refine it into simpler things. Like if, if there's something like one mood that you're after in the film or like there's some specific words or things like that, that it's easier to sort of start to get images uh, from. Uh, and then the methodology of how to shoot it comes later, comes with a director's intentions. Like some directors are impulsive and need a lot of freedom um, that I worked with, uh, where you need to sort of start to plan a look out of that too, to take that into consideration that someone may want to uh, always come to a set and you can shoot 360. That could be a challenge that affects the look, uh, no matter you want it or not, but you would sort of adapt to it because there's no there's no reason to sort of work against <laughs> uh, a, a director. It's better to stick with the director's vision and understand it and, and really like want to do it and, and feel love for the project that way, you know? And then it's slowly, I, that's what I feel like it's important with a lot of prep because you want that time to build that language together. And hopefully you, you probably have your taste that affects it, but ideally the films are just whatever that script asked for, you know, like, um, and has its own look. And not that I would like ever try to like do that again, actually, but rather always start with the script and, and the director's vision. And let's go back in time a few years. Were there any movie shots or, or camera angles when you were growing up that you watched that just have always stuck with you and maybe maybe were the reason you wanted to become a cinematographer? I always remember the shot from Jurassic Park where the T-Rex is growling and then the sign comes fluttering down in front of him. It's just something that always stuck with me. Uh, Christina, how about you? Anything from your childhood? Well, it's funny. Last night I was I was talking with one of the producers on our film and I was telling him I was nervous about this. And um, Ellen Curris actually gave me a call to give me some advice. And Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Line is one of the movies that I, you know, have referenced so much throughout my career and that really made me want to pursue being a DP. And um it's the shot when, you know, they're running through the beach house and they're trying to hold on to this memory. And it's something that I so often revisit and think about, about what it feels like to be in a memory and just how she was able to really in that film make you feel emotionally what it feels like to be in the past and in a memory and trying to hold on something. And I just thought it was such a, a brilliant way that she was able to transcribe emotion into a, a visual aid mm. and yeah eternal sunshine is actually my number one movie of all time so I, i'm <laughs> so glad you mentioned that uh, matthew how about you any shots that have always stuck with you um i always think about that the the wide shot in the room and like last tango in paris when they're sort of um facing each other and wrapped up in each other uh as just the just such a picturesque sort of uh, masterclass in light and simplicity. Um, mm. So I, you know, that's forever ingrained in my mind is that, that frame. Um, but there's also a shot in uh, Lovers on the Bridge, uh, directed by Leo Tada, where um, Julia Binoche, and I forget the actor's name, are running down a beach. I think that's the film. And he's got this huge erection. And you can, <laughs> you just see his, you know, his junk just bouncing around in a big silhouette is pretty, pretty stunning. I, that's, that's another shot I think is uh, really maximizes the potential of cinema. <laughs> and Lena? <laughs> oh, it's so hard. You, um, I feel my, if I pick a shot, uh, some, I mean, generally I was very inspired, I think, by, you know, film noir films. That was like my, my sort of what made me interested in cinematography because I got seduced into the sort of lighting of that way they lit um, noirs. But one actually um, shot that I think of as like a really genius shot that I, it comes back to my mind just because it's, it's just so brilliant in the way it's, it's done uh, for what the story they want to tell. And that's in seven when 
Brad Pitt is on the ground. He's fell down from some sort of uh, building, right? He's by a car and the, the villain is like over him with the gun and the shot is like of the gun in focus. You, you see uh, the villain in the background in kind of silhouette, but you, you could have seen him if it was sharp, but the focus is on the barrel of the gun. And that just, I think of it a lot because like oftentimes, because it reminds me of like the importance of the shots that it makes a difference, right? Cause you don't want to reveal the, the villain in that shot. So it's a very smart way of not revealing him, but seeing him. So it's always that, right? Like we have those tools like focus and lighting and, and things that could help um, the storytelling. And it, it just came to my mind right now as one of the shots that comes back. Hmm. And uh, I kind of want to end with talking about if there, what are some misconceptions that people out there, uh, movie fans have about cinematography, about film photography, about what you you all do for a living? Like, are there any anything you want to clear up about you know, misconceptions people may have about your professions, uh, Christina? That's a great question. Um, wow. <laughs> I think a lot of the times it's about or something that I find myself trying not to fall into the trap of is how beautiful a shot is. And I think oftentimes calling attention to the camera and being showy can be a disservice to the the emotion that's going on in a scene or and it, it's not true to what the character is experiencing. So, you know, it, it's not all about how beautiful every shot is, but more so how much it, it serves the story and the trajectory of the film and how honest it is to the character and, and what they're experiencing the moment. It's, it's such a subjective medium. And I think you have so much power as the DP to um, either put it on the right course or draw attention to yourself. And I, I try to be as true to the subject matter and the director's vision. Matthew, how about you? Well, I think that, um, you know, I think people assume that we we just deal with a camera. I don't know if they understand, like the general public understands how much uh, goes into the light and how much that the light is what, how we distinguish um, from each other and distinguish one film from another is how we choose to um, uh, articulate the light. And great language. I think, um, you know, most people think it's just the camera, um, especially today where it's completely democratized where you have digital cameras that you can use and everybody gets a chance to do it. Um, but what the, the craft of actually having to do, say you have six shots in a scene and you're basically, you just, you're, you're isolating a moment in time and it takes you eight hours to do it, you know, because you know how to light and you know how to replicate that naturalism. Um, I don't think people, uh, I don't know if it's a misconception. I just think it's not, it's not top of mind to general, general public. Um, but, uh, and I also think that, you know, in terms of the camera, I, it's a shared object between us and the directors. Some directors are more um, intense and uh, adept with it. And some people are just sort of let that, let the cameraman do it. Uh, or sort of cinematographers sort of taking control of where the camera goes, but uh, it's it's no matter what style of director you're working with, it's a shared object. Hmm. And Linus, close us out here. Um, I agree with both of you. I think, first of all, I think the general public. I mean, they may not even know what a cinematographer is. I mean, just when I tell the border people <laughs> when I come into America, they're like, "What is that?" <laughs> but, um, uh, but but I think yeah I I agree it's like the the misconception generally I think is that they think you're basically a camera operator, which is a brilliant work itself, which a lot of cinematographers are as well, and other operators are just operators, but they're brilliant on it. But it's really about for me, it's really about what what I try to explain is that we're dealing with the mood of the film, right? It's like. I feel like more related to kind of the composer than the production designer or the camera operator or the uh or or or, or the costume designer. It's like 
sure, we deal with the production sign and we deal with the operator and we have to work with, with our common departments that are there, but I feel more related to the composer because I feel like our job is really about um, helping the director to translate with that and helping the actors and director to translate it into a visual language that if you turn off the sound, right, you should still feel, ideally, feel as much as possible of what, what goes on uh, and the feeling of the emotions. And the emotions could be thriller or it could be whatever, different things, right? But that is the core of it, I think. And how do you do that? Well, you got to work with the light, whether it's naturalistic or or artificial. And... um and and it's not it's not something you maybe can you kind of have to learn its craft uh, to learn uh, manipulating the light or or maintain light throughout the day even if it's naturalistic or natural uh, real sound so it's really about controlling the light in but with a vision that you have a vision about the light and and that's your thing it's not the director's thing I think the director should be happy about the light but it's like your 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 thing to to create it and and sort of basically be the painter and and with the production designer and and the set decorator and, and the costume uh, deal with uh, with colors and with with these things that you will affect with your lighting so it's really about lighting more than anything um, sure we're i mean i love to operate as well and i love cameras and the process of the negative and all, all. but um, I think the key is the lighting actually that, that people don't know. As someone who takes a lot of selfies, I, I can agree. Lighting is very important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I want to thank you all for joining us today. And if there's any awards voters out there, Oscar voters, please remember American fiction, maestro and salt burn when it comes time to marking off your ballots. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you all.